Tonight on The Buzz, we are looking at the current state of post-production, from individual artists to large companies. But first, Jonathan Handel has an update on the conflict between writers and talent agencies. Then, we start our look at post-production with Terrence Curran, founder and president of Alpha Dogs. Terry looks at the business challenges faced by smaller operators. Today is a great time for telling stories, but can you make money at it? Next, Oliver Peters is the senior editor at Oliver Peters Post-Production Services. He's an independent artist who works on a variety of projects. Tonight, he describes the challenges in workflow and media management along with new technology that he's watching for the future. Next, Christopher Ray is a colorist at Picture Shop. He's a specialist in episodic television and he discusses the role of the colorist in pre-production and on set as well as new trends blurring the lines between episodic and features. Next, Mark Radonis is the Senior VP of Post-Production at Buna Murray. With a focus on reality TV and producing multiple shows at once, Mark looks at the challenges of Post differently. His view of the future is that providing services is no longer enough, and he has a radical solution for any sized Post House. All this plus James DeRuvo with our weekly Doddle News update. The buzz starts now. Since the dawn of digital filmmaking. Authoritative. One show serves a worldwide network of media professionals. Current. Uniting industry experts. Production. Filmmakers. Post-production. And content creators around the planet. Distribution. Distribution. From the media capital of the world in Los Angeles, California, the digital production buzz goes live now. Welcome to the digital production buzz, the world's longest running podcast for the creative content industry covering media production, post-production and marketing around the world. Hi, my name is Larry Jordan. I've been thinking a lot about the state of our industry since before NAB, actually. So this month, we decided to devote a series of shows looking at what's happening and what to expect going forward. This week, we look at post-production. Next week, we'll talk with producers. The week after covers cameras and production. What I'm struck by this week is the range in opinions. Some are pessimistic, others are optimistic, and each of our guests is watching something different in technology and trying to plan for the future. This will be a very interesting show. By the way, if you enjoy The Buzz, please give us a positive rating and review in the iTunes store. We appreciate your support to help us grow our audience. But first, let's get an update on the news with our weekly Doddle News Update with James DeRuvo. Hello, James. Happy Thursday, Larry. And a wonderful Thursday to you. What's in the news? Well, we have some sadness in the news today. Oh, dear. Amazon Amazon has announced that they're killing the online story writer and story builder tools. These free online tools were for screenwriting and storyboarding, and they will be shut down effective June 30th, 2019. Amazon stopped accepting project pitches through the portal for their Amazon Studios about a year ago, so it really was only a matter of time. And users are advised to download their projects or print out their storyboards before the deadline, because after that, they will be deleted from Amazon's servers. Well, it seems like online collaboration tools for writers are struggling. Adobe did the same thing a couple of years ago. What are your thoughts? It really is a pity, especially with Amazon Storyboard. I really liked their interface, and being able to go directly to Story Builder to create your storyboards was a pretty seamless experience. The benefit being that an online interface means that you can work on your story from anywhere, be it on a computer or a tablet or even an iPhone, which is where I get the majority of my ideas when I'm just like out and about. But since Amazon only greenlit one story idea through the Amazon Studios portal in five years, it kind of makes sense that they would close it down and devote their resources to other tools. Meanwhile, I suggest users go over to Celtix, C-E-L-T-X dot com and use their online servers. They have access to pretty much the same tools. Okay. Amazon's our lead story. What's our second story this week? A short film competition. iFootageGear.com is launching their first ever short film competition with 
$40,000 in prizes. It's a wide open competition with the rules being that it be an original short film of three to 10 minutes in length in order to qualify for the competition. Grand prizes include a Red Raven 4.5K cinema camera package that includes the camera, a Blackmagic Video Assist 4K monitor recorder, Rode VideoMic Pro Plus, and an Aperture 120 Mark II LED video light, amongst other prizes. $40,000 in prizes in total. Hmm. Prizes are wonderful, but are we getting too many video contests? I don't think you can have too many video contests, quite honestly. The great thing about them is, is that this enables filmmakers and content creators to practice. And the more you practice, the more you find your voice. Add to that exposure, experience with film competitions, and a free entry fee for this particular competition. All you have to lose is time. Hmm. All right, that's a good point. So we'll check out iFootage. What's our third story? Vimeo is creating a free footage section for their stock footage exchange. They created the stock footage exchange at the beginning of the year, and they have announced Vimeo Essentials, thousands of royalty-free stock footage clips as an incentive to all plus members and above who have signed up for their stock footage service. The cost begins at $84 annually for the plus level membership. Well, it seems like we're awash in stock footage companies. Why Vimeo? Why Vimeo? Why any of them, really? And But I'm all for more stock footage sites. The more stock footage portals you have available to you, the less likely you'll get repetition of stock footage clips. And that keeps filmmaking fresh while keeping costs low. And for Vimeo in particular, at $84 a year for the plus level, that's not a bad deal, even without the free incentives of thousands of free video clips. Think of it this way. That's only 15 cups of coffee from Starbucks that you can leave in your shot just like Game of Thrones. <laughs> that is, without a doubt, the most famous coffee cup ever. But it's time and the sun is done. The editorial team at Game of Thrones has already removed it for future streaming. And thinking of the future, what other stories are you and your team following this week? Other stories we're following include DJI is working on a GoPro killer action camera. There's instructions on our site to make a DIY LED light out of a cake pan. <laughs> and can you tell the difference between footage shot on a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K and an iPhone XS? That's an interesting question. Yes, indeed. Very cool. Where can we go on the web to learn more? All these stories and more can be found at dottlenews.com or on Twitter at Doddle News. And James DeRuvo is the editor-in-chief of Doddle News and joins us every week. We'll see you next Thursday. See you then. Jonathan Handel is an entertainment and technology attorney of counsel at Troy Gould in Los Angeles, but... More importantly, right now, he is the contributing editor on entertainment labor issues for The Hollywood Reporter and covering in depth the ongoing struggle between the Writers Guild of America and talent agencies. Hello, Jonathan. Welcome back. Good to be back with you, Larry. Bring us up to date on this whole Writers Guild talent agency situation. When we last talked two weeks ago, the writers had fired their agents, the WGA was using a website for writers to find work, and everybody was heading to the courts. Where are we now? It's pretty much the, the same place, honestly. The um, litigation is pending. The Writers Guild did sue the four major agencies, which are uh, WME, CAA, UTA, and ICM, the four largest agencies. They have not yet filed their response to the lawsuit. That response should come within a, a week or two. The Writers Guild said that over 7,000 writers had fired their agents out of 8,800 who, uh, who had agents. None of the large or medium-sized agencies have, have signed the Writers Guild Code of Conduct. That's still the uh, status that we're at. And we're really in this period where things are, are grinding along, I guess is the best way to put it. Some writers are starting to dissent. We're hearing from the Guild's um, tactics and tone. What are the writers objecting to? Why the dissent? The dissent is sort of twofold. One is that writers who object to the tone that the Guild has taken, which has been very scorched earth in terms of the the rhetoric around uh, the agencies, that the agencies are cartels and that 
packaging fees are are criminal and and illegal kickbacks and it's a corrupt system and 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 all that pretty strong language very strong language very uncompromising language that's right and that has not sat well with all uh writers although you know it 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 has sat well with um with a large number of them the other thing is that there are a number of writers who have expressed to me and and or to their agencies that when they voted in favor of the um, code of conduct, which was a 95 percent uh, yes vote out of those voting and, and the turnout was high, it was like roughly half the guild or something, that they felt that they were giving the guild leverage to negotiate and they were unhappy and uncomfortable when they discovered that the guild was using this as a reason to take a, oh, a very – strong posture and not negotiate on the issue of uh, packaging fees, but simply say, you know, or affiliate production and simply say, we want these practices to end. But again, to be clear, most members of the guild probably are supporting what the union is doing now. How have the talent agencies responded? Are they returned the same tone or are they being silent or how are they fighting back? Well, they have not returned the same tone at all at any time, really, throughout this uh, enterprise. They have not aggressively been uh, been fighting back. I, you know, I think that will come with the litigation response, perhaps. But you know, they're hanging tough. Some of the medium-sized and smaller agencies appear to be suffering or anticipating greater pain than the large agencies. You know, the large four are very diversified. They have divisions that handle sports. They have divisions that handle branding and corporate representation. And, and of course, within entertainment, they represent directors and actors, even if the writers have, you know, have fired them. So those agencies, the large agencies, are probably better positioned, ironically, to withstand the guild's battle here, even though they are largely the ones that are the target of the guild. As you look for the next two or three weeks, what do you see happening in the near future? Well, in the near future, I see more of the same, plus the litigation response from the agencies. What I do think may happen next year is that we may see the Writers Guild and perhaps the Screen Actors Guild, SAG-AFTRA, either or both, threaten to strike and perhaps go on strike against the studios. We're in a very mobilized membership at this point in the Writers Guild, and if they can maintain solidarity for another, it's a long time, another 12 months, the legacy studios are, it seems to me, uniquely vulnerable to a strike because they're desperate to catch up with uh, and topple Netflix, especially Disney is. These companies in particular, Disney, Warner, and Comcast, NBC Universal, are spending billions of dollars to set up their own streaming services. And that relies on a, an uninterrupted supply of fresh scripted content. That makes them more vulnerable than they have been in a long time to, uh, to possible strikes. So it sounds like this is going to be a long process, not a quickly resolved one. I think that's right. And that's true both on the macro level in terms of the labor disputes and and also in particular regarding the litigation, which I don't think is going to get bounced out of the box at an early stage. I think it's going to continue. Jonathan, for people who want to keep track of this issue going forward, where can they go on the web? Two places, THR Labor, the Hollywood Reporter Labor is what it stands for, THRLabor.com. And for more about me, my website, jhandel.com, J-H-A-N-D-E-L.com. Those websites, again, are THRLabor.com and jhandel, H-A-N-D-E-L, jhandel.com. And Jonathan Handel is the contributing editor on entertainment labor issues for The Hollywood Reporter. And Jonathan, thanks for joining us today. Thanks very much, Larry. I want to introduce you to a new website, Thalo.com. Thalo is an artist community and networking site for creative people to connect, be inspired, and showcase their creativity. Thalo.com features content from around the world with a global perspective on all things creative. Thalo is the place for creative folks to learn, collaborate, market, and sell their works. 
Thalo is a part of Thalo Arts, a worldwide community of artists, filmmakers, and storytellers. From photography to filmmaking, performing arts to fine arts, and everything in between, Thalo is filled with the resources you need to succeed. Visit Thalo.com and discover how their community can help you connect, learn, and succeed. That's Thalo.com. Terrence Kern is the founder and president of Alpha Dogs, a Burbank-based post-production facility that he started in 2002. Terry is also the host of the Editor's Lounge, a regular gathering of post-production professionals interested in improving their craft. Hello, Terry. Welcome back. Good to be here, Larry. Terry, this week we're looking at the current state of post-production, and I can't think of a better person to start with than yourself. So to set the scene, how would you describe Alpha Dogs? Alpha Dogs would be a, a mid-sized post house. We're primarily a finishing house, meaning we do the color correction, the audio mixing, graphics, etc. Basically, the guys who don't let the coffee cup in the background get by. <laughs> <laughs> who are typical clients and projects? A lot of different stuff, but our bread and butter is reality show finishing, lower budget indie features, documentaries, et cetera. That, that's our primary work. And then we have a lot of spurious little side stuff. I mean, you know, we'll do anything, but we've been doing, uh, you know, fixing um, security camera footage for police trials. Um, I don't know. We, we're doing a, a localization for a lot of different shows and things like that. So there you go. Are your typical clients independent producers, and are they going to social media, or what's their distribution outlet? Uh, again, that, that varies by it. Most of the reality shows are cable. Some of them recently have been direct streaming shows, and then the indie features are generally wherever they can get distribution. Terry, you've talked before that these are challenging times for post. What makes them challenging? Oof. The biggest thing that makes it challenging is that the equipment is basically free now. I mean, you can buy Resolve for free. That means that everybody has access to the tool set. That would be okay if the end user, the consumer, had a real understanding and appreciation for quality. And then we would still work because we're craftsmen, right? And so our ability to, to polish and turn out a very polished product would be worth people paying for but our biggest enemy is the it's good enough sentiment and when the consumers say oh that's good enough then our services aren't as valued or as important anymore so that's the biggest challenge and that didn't used to be the case when the market was much more limited and the the gear was much more expensive which uh, uh, limited the amount of people that could get into the industry you had to be really really good to get in and you had to uh, stay good to stay working. One of the things that's adding additional complexity is it not only is technology getting cheaper, it's also getting more powerful. At NEB, for instance, this spring, AI and machine learning was everywhere. Oh, yeah. What do you see as their impact on post-production? Uh, I get accused of being the uh, doomsayer, but long term, we're, we're really in deep trouble because technology is eventually going to replace most, if not all, jobs. It's just a question of what's the timeline. In post, the first area where it's going to impact, and it's already starting to, is a lot of the repetitive or redundant type tasks, because that's the low-hanging fruit. So something as simple as syncing dailies, which used to be a very manual process, now can be done you know, by uh, matching up the, the waveforms. And the next level will be when they start being able to identify the faces and the type of shot it is, and then all of a sudden you have AI logging the footage instead of loggers and assistant editors. If your job is doing something redundant and repetitive day after day, you should be looking for something else. What signs for hope do you see? It depends on what you're looking for. There's always hope in any situation, right? It's changing. For those of us who've been in the industry for a while, it's not good. If you were to say, what's the big picture uh, outlook of post-production, at least in LA, I would say it's kind of the elimination of the middle class of post. 
I think I've given you this analogy before, but if not, I'll, I'll give it to you again because it's my favorite. Historically, throughout all of written history, if you wanted to entertain people, you were a starving artist. You traveled from town to town and you hoped to make enough doing a play or whatever to, to get some meals and maybe get a night's sleep, right? And then this weird thing happened where we came along and we had a film camera and you could record somebody's performance once and then play it back a ton of times and charge for it. Suddenly, there became a way of making a lot of money as an artist, but it was a limited world. It cost so much money to make the films and to distribute them and all that. It kept it very a tight group, which created this artificial, gigantic community of people making a lot of money as artists. What I see now is we've taken away those uh, strangleholds, so now anybody can make content and get it out there. And I just see us going back to kind of starving artist land again. So how are you positioning yourself for the future? So we're starting to do renting out our edit bays for those guys who do work at home, but then have to have clients come into screen or come in and listen to a mix. So they can come in here, do their mix I mean, you know, with the client, show them the mix, et cetera. They work at home, come in here, do the final viewing. And then we handle the deliverables because the deliverables now are just ever expanding layers of complexity on who, you, you know, depending on who you're delivering to. You're the first of four interviews that we're doing to talk about post in tonight's show. And in his interview, Mark Rodonis, who's with Boone and Murray, makes the case that post companies need to start owning their own content. Is this something that you've considered? Actually, from the beginning, when we started Alpha Dogs, we, we intended to do that. Um, it gets a little tricky because then all of a sudden we're competitors with our clients. He's right. I mean, basically, you're either producing and owning content or uh, you're working for somebody who is, you know, where, where we used to fit in, in general, the middle class post houses. We're just not that much in demand anymore. So. I don't know. It, it's an interesting time from that standpoint. It is indeed. I, I think it's it's as dramatic a shift as when we went from analog to digital. There's a lot of skills that we needed back in the analog days were no longer needed. Mm-hmm. And I hate to say that the skills aren't needed. That's probably the difference. Going from analog to, to uh, digital, yes, you no longer needed the analog skills. But what's happening now is you really do still need. I mean, I don't know. It, it is a challenging it's a challenging time. It's hard to stay upbeat overall. But if I was starting out right now, it would be great. The technology is cheap and available to absolutely everywhere, everybody. And where the distribution uh, method is available to everybody, you can you know throw it up on YouTube and everybody on the planet can see it. If I was starting out now, I'd be going crazy because I'd be young, not needing to have a big income, not needing to sustain a household and a family and all that. And I would just be out there making content like crazy because I could. That's, you know, so from from the starting out standpoint, it's great. From the, you know, we've been in this and built up careers standpoint, it's a little different. It sounds like a, it's a great time to create content and not a great time to create money. That's really what it is, is. Everybody's trying to figure out how to monetize now. There's so much content out there right now that there's not enough money to do the same level of quality overall that we used to do, if that makes sense. Makes perfect sense. Terry, for people that want to hire you for their next project, where can they go on the web? You can go to alphadog.tv. And uh, we also do uh, Editor's Lounge. If you're interested in learning tips and tricks and stuff from editors, that's editorslounge.com. That website is all one word, A-L-P-H-A-D-O-G-S, alphadogs.tv, not .com. And I encourage everybody to attend an Editor's Lounge session. They are always interesting. And Terrence Curran is the founder and president of Alpha Dogs. And Terry, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, Larry. Oliver Peters is based in Central Florida and is the award-winning editor and colorist running Oliver Peters Post-Production Services, and he's done so for the last 35 years. He's also a contributing editor to many popular technology magazines. Hello, Oliver. Welcome back. Hello. Tonight, we're looking at the status of post-production from a variety of perspectives. So tell us about your work. 
My uh, work is a mixture of editorial and color correction. Unlike a lot of other colorists, I also do some creative editing and then all the way through to finishing. So it's uh, the whole gamut. Well, one of the things that I was reading in something you sent me before we started the interview is that not only do you editorial and color grading, but you also consult in media management and workflow. What does that mean? I do uh, a lot of work at mainly one particular production company. I sort of function as the senior person around here. Since I'm the person who gets all the media at the end of the line when it's time to color correct and deliver, I kind of have a hand in making sure the workflow is correct on the front end. Proper file naming, proper folder locations, all of that stuff. It is amazing to me how something that simple, when it gets screwed up, can take and just run a project off the rails. Yeah, I'm actually working on a current project that's a, a side project on the outside that I'm manually having to re-edit in all of the camera shots because nothing relinks correctly. <laughs> oh, ow, ow, ow. That hurts just to hear you tell me about. <laughs> One of the things that you've done, if I remember correctly, is you've got multiple computers all talking into a central server. How are you handling file management from a server, and more importantly, how are you handling collaboration and team projects? Primarily, this is in an Adobe shop, and we're running two shared storage systems right now. One is QNAP, uh, the other one is LumaForge Jellyfish. All of our workstations talk to both systems. Premiere, the, everything lives on the storage, so uh, that includes project files pretty much just works. We're pretty regimented in terms of keeping our folder structure clean, but it's not any kind of a shared workflow in the same sense that Media Composer would be. So you're not having five different editors and assistants inside the same project. Premiere works a little bit differently, so we can have multiple editors open copies of the same project or one editor can have write authority and the others can open it as a read only. So that's kind of how we work. We only have a few projects where editors are in the same project simultaneously. It's more that we all tap into sort of a common pool of media. You've been editing for a long time, essentially through the transition from film and analog to standard def digital to where we are today. As you look at the industry today, what trends are you seeing in post? Obviously, as computers have more horsepower, you need less and less bespoke hardware. Uh, so the days of a big beefy workstation are kind of optional. It's not that you don't need it, but you can get by with less. And so the, the facilities tend to be smaller edit rooms, Fewer of them are client-oriented because clients tend to be working remotely, you know, a lot of the review and approval through online resources. And so that affects what hardware you need in the room and how much of a computer you need and also simple things, how many sofas, you know, and how big does the room need to be. I would say it's more of a minimalist approach than it might have been 5, 10, 20 years ago. So you don't necessarily need as much peripheral hardware as you used to in the past. What are your thoughts on the new trend of editing in the cloud? I'm not a big believer in editing in the cloud. Uh, we use the cloud for moving files around and review and approval. But to actually have a high quality, high res files up in the cloud, I'm just not a believer in that because what tends to happen is is just about when the technology is close enough, then we move the goalposts in terms <laughs> of uh, resolution, right? So at NAB, you had a lot of product that was already ready for the market uh, around 8K. There was discussion about 16K, but we're barely making 4K workflows work for the most part. So uh, to start trying to put that up in the cloud for anything other than proxy editorial, I just don't see that happening anytime soon. And then you've got the obvious issues of security and privacy and so on that start getting you past the, the garden variety, you know, internet connection that most people in a smaller shop would have available to them. 
What are clients looking for today? Is there a common thread aside from the obvious ones, which is shorter deadlines and smaller budgets? A lot of uh, projects these days tend to have a social media component. So if you're doing broadcast, there is a social media aspect to every show. Sometimes that involves additional shooting on location just to get, you know, the host saying different things that they can later put on Instagram or YouTube or whatever. Also, projects that tended to be broadcast before now have many different outlets. So some sort of a sponsored program or maybe an infomercial or something in broadcast TV, those are now being restructured as shorter form sponsored programs rather that run on various streaming channels. So clients are coming to you not just with the traditional, you know, make me a commercial, make me a broadcast show, but rather I've got this media strategy that includes entertainment, but it also includes marketing and sales and so on. And they expect you to know what the options are and how to get there. As you look at the landscape, how are you positioning yourself for the future? Well, obviously, you always want to keep up with the technology. It's a matter of knowing what's around the corner, staying up on the technology. As far as Me as an individual, it's trying to stay as current with the various software that's out there. I tend to wear different hats as an editor, so I have to know several different uh, software packages for editing and color correction as well. Thinking of keeping up with the technology, what technologies caught your attention? NAB was a little bit different, I thought, this year because it was uh, more about the B in NAB. So by that, I mean broadcasters. Uh, There were less of the the kind of fad things we've seen in the past, like uh, 360 and stereo 3D. And there was uh, certainly not a ton of drones like we've seen in years past. So it was more about the nuts and bolts. And although it's not really something we particularly deal with, I did notice that IP infrastructure, uh, internet protocol, was very definitely uh, all over the show. What used to be SDI wiring and audio cables and so on, if you were building a TV station, that's now starting to become IP technology. And I think that's something that's going to affect the industry pretty uh, greatly over the coming years. Obviously, uh, shared storage was of interest, but We had already made our decision prior to NAB, but you always want to make sure that you made the right decision. And (laughs) Resolve 16 was of interest. Uh, I thought the keyboard was a funny quirk, I guess I want to say, uh, just because I used to run a Sony 9100 uh, linear controller, and that uh, keyboard was very reminiscent. So... (laughs) As a number of other folks have noted, it's almost like you kind of go, well, haven't we moved past that? (laughs) (laughs) Oliver, for people that want to hire you for their next project, where can they go on the web? Uh, Simplest place is at my website, oliverpeters.com. That's all one word, O-L-I-V-E-R-P-E-T-E-R-S, oliverpeters.com. And Oliver is the owner and president of Oliver Peters Post-Production Services. And thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much. Christopher Ray is an experienced colorist with credits on a number of award-winning productions. His work encompasses Alpha, Tomorrowland, Warcraft, The Great Wall, The Crossing, Orange is the New Black, and many more. Hello, Christopher. Welcome. Hello. Tonight, we're looking at the status of post-production from a variety of perspectives. Tell us about your work. I work as a colorist here at uh, Picture Shop Post. We do primarily episodic, but you, as you can see from my credits in the past, I've worked on feature films, and we still do some of that work. Just this uh, post house is predominantly episodic, and some commercial work, music videos, you know, anything, uh, anything that needs a nice aesthetic grade. Well, I've had the great pleasure of visiting your site, which is ChristopherMRay.com, and I love the before and after examples of what an image looks like when it's shot and what it looks like after you're done working with it. How do you determine where to start 
when you're given a new project? That is always an interesting thing that kind of changes project to project. I always try and right off the start, read the script, um, be able to get scripts and be able to be involved as early as possible. Because in post-production, typically, you know, we are, especially with color, with final color, we're the very last or one of the very last pieces in the chain. So the more we can get involved at the start of the show with reading the script, kind of getting the narrative as we start to build palettes, color wise, that those have some effect and are enhancing the narrative and are not just color tweaks for the sake of kind of looking cool. Usually they'll have some kind of lookbook that they have begin to create ahead of time to kind of sell the how some of the locations are going to look and how some of the costumes are going to look. That always ends up deviating to some degree. But once we're able to kind of start talking about those things as things evolve with the shooting, it kind of helps steer that process of what the pre-production looked like, how things are looking in post-production or in production, and then how we might want to manipulate and augment that in post-production. I can understand your interest in wanting to get involved with the story. But what's the advantage of bringing the colorist in before we even shoot frame one? That's something that even 10 years ago, I would say, was not very common. But now, almost every project that I work on now, we try to do at least some set visits. There's a lot of interesting things when the colorist can come involved earlier on when you're talking with the DP. And, you know, especially with these days when production schedules get faster and faster, where there's a dialogue that can be had about, okay, well, we can't quite do the blocking that we want to do here, but we can kind of talk and and brainstorm about how we might be able to augment that in post to be able to get a better look in the end. Collaboration is always a great thing. And, you know, and the DP knows sometimes when they don't have time to do this or the color is not quite looking right given some of the atmospheric elements of the environment, having that back and forth discussion of kind of knowing in post was where we can go with it really helps. And not in a fix it in post kind of way where we're taking, you know, oh, don't worry about that. We can just kind of totally do this. But being aware of what we can do on the back end to help inform the decisions that can be done in production. You're essentially a hired gun working on whatever projects roll through the door. What trends are you seeing in post these days? Like I said earlier, I'm predominantly working in episodic television right now. And the really interesting thing that has come with episodic television is kind of the blurring of this line between was considered to be episodic type looks and more of feature film type looks with the advent of streaming and the streaming platforms and there being some further kind of creativity being put into some of the looks and less steadfast rules that have to be applied. It's been really interesting to see the lines being blurred of what before would typically be more of an episodic look or more of a feature look, which is really great for a colorist. And I think all the creatives involved to be able to have some more of that leeway of playing things you know, a little bit more saturated with colors and scenes and kind of really pushing the emotions with the grade. Sometimes it means softer blacks, which is a bit more of a feature aesthetic. And it's not to say that there is a set episodic look or a set feature look, but typically with features, there's a little bit more freedom, which we're starting to see some of that in the episodic area, which has been really nice as an artist and as a colorist. One of the subjects I was hearing at NAB this last April was the automation of color grading. Clearly, that's a potential threat for colorists like yourself, but is this something that you're overly concerned about? It's not. It's something that I've seen and experienced and played with over the years just to kind of understand what it's doing. It's basically analyzing the waveforms, and it's saying, balance all these black levels, balance these white levels. This is kind of the rough density that it needs to be. And, you know, it may be in a very simple dailies grade kind of way that that could be useful. But in the end, the main thing that you're paying for with a good colorist is the aesthetic, is the eye. It's an artist that you're collaborating with to be able to enhance that picture. And until we get into some kind of Terminator 
type situation where the machines are becoming smarter than we are, we're still going to have the the ability with our brains to do things aesthetically that machines just can't compute. One of the trends in post overall are shorter deadlines and smaller budgets. What trends are you seeing? I would definitely say that is true overall. Quicker turnarounds is definitely across the board. Uh, with the streaming, I would say with different projects where you see them maybe putting in some more money and some more uh, time into really enhancing the look of the show, which kind of goes hand in hand with a bit more of that feature type approach. But timeline wise, it's definitely getting quicker and quicker. The only thing that really helps offset that is the tools have been developing and all the software has really been coming leaps and bounds in the last 10 years how much you can get it to work for you so that the technical side of things you can do as efficiently as possible to allow yourself the the proper and ample time to do the creative and subjective things that you need to do. Given the pressures that are seemingly ongoing of, of shorter deadlines and raised client expectations and smaller budgets, how are you positioning yourself for the future? I'm a base light colorist. I use uh, the software base light made by film light mm -hmm. and they have something called a BLG workflow that has really in my eyes really been a game changer where in the past you've had with dailies and onset type grading, you've had what's called CDLs, which are, you know, very easy and simple three way color corrections that, you know, definitely have done the job in the past. But that information can't really get passed forward because it's not really somewhere a final colorist can expand upon technology wise, just the grades are so uh, limited. So with the BLG, what uh, Filmlight has done is they've created a pre-light software for dits to use on set. There's a daylight software for dailies and then the base light finishing software through this BLG workflow, you can actually include any operator that the final software has. So windows, keys, mats, anything that you want to put in there can be passed down the line. Now, it's not to say that we go for the final grade right off the very start. It's something that we build up to, but having those tools and those operators that translate right into the final software, A, it helps that collaboration of people on set seeing something that is a little bit more refined, and then in dailies, it can be a refined a little bit more, and then in final color. And the other thing is just that if we have a good pipeline there, that work that is being brought to the table through the BLG files can be a starting point and not having to kind of grade from scratch with just using it as a reference. So I think utilizing something like that really helps A, creatively with, like I said before, just the collaboration throughout the process and B, efficiency wise of being able to actually tangibly use that work that the DIT is doing on set and the dailies colorist is doing in the dailies. Some very, very cool stuff. Yeah. For people who want to hire you to work on their next project, where can we go on the web? Uh, you can go to my personal site, ChristopherMRay.com, or you can go to Picture Shop site, which is PictureShop.com. I'm easy to get a hold of via either. Those two websites are Christopher M. Ray, all one word, ChristopherMRay.com, and Picture Shop, again, all one word. That's P-I-C-T-U-R-E-S-H-O-P, -E PictureShop.com, and Christopher Ray is the colorist for Picture Shop. And Christopher, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Larry. Here's another website I want to introduce you to, dottlenews.com. Dottle News gives you a portal into the broadcast, video, and film industries. It's a leading online resource presenting news, reviews, and products for the film and video industry. Dottle News also offers a resource guide and crew management platform specifically designed for production. These digital call sheets, along with their app, directory, and premium listings, provide in-depth organizational tools for busy production professionals. Dottle News is a part of the Thalo Arts community, a worldwide community of artists, filmmakers, and storytellers. 
From photography to filmmaking, performing arts to fine arts, and everything in between, Thalo is filled with resources you need to succeed. Whether you want the latest industry news, need to network with other creative professionals, or require state-of-the-art online tools to manage your next project, there's only one place to go, dawdlednews.com. As Senior Vice President of Post-Production, Mark Rodonis oversees the editing and final finishing of all Buna Murray Productions. Mark focuses on developing a post-production workflow, which is unique to reality TV, where Buna Murray routinely finishes hours of programming each week. It is always fun to say, hello, Mark, welcome back. Hi, Larry. Good to talk to you again. Mark, earlier in the show, we've heard from smaller post houses and individual artists, but Buna Murray represents the other side of the scale. You guys are huge. How would you describe Buna Murray? Buna Murray is a television production company that specializes in reality TV. We basically started in the early 90s with MTV's The Real World, which really pioneered the whole reality genre. We do have, oh, depending on what time you ask me, anywhere from three to ten shows currently on the air or in distribution. So, yeah, we do have a pretty high volume of of shows that, that go out the door. If you're looking at the future of production companies, just being a production entity is not going to be enough anymore. You need to own your content. You need to be able to go into different areas. So just being a, a, a gun for hire um, I don't think is a recipe for future success. So we are trying to branch into different areas. We are trying to own some of our content. It's a recognition that the world in which we live and specifically how shows are created and distributed is changing. But I think you're making an assumption. Not everybody is the size of your company. Individual right. contributors can't own their own content in most cases. Or are you saying oh, Larry, they have Larry, to? Larry, Larry, Larry. I disagree. I mean, I think the, the means of production have come down to the point where, yeah, I mean, a YouTube influencer owns the means of their production, and they are essentially their own channel. And yes, it is a possibility. So whether you're looking at, you know, a multi-million dollar production or something that comes out of your bedroom, economies are sort of the same. Anyway, that's my, that's my take on it. No, it's an interesting take, and you're absolutely right. For instance, I have my own YouTube channel, and I own the content, and I am somewhat smaller than Buna Murray. Yeah, yeah. So, so there you go. Uh, <laughs> and that, and that's, that's where I think things are headed. It's a big pie, and there's room for a lot of people to have a slice of it. Mark, I was just thinking, distribution has exploded. How has distribution changed for Buna Murray? Well, let me tell you a story, Larry. Um, Buna Murray made it to the public's attention via MTV's The Real World back in the early 90s. That was the, the beginning of reality TV as we know it. That show lasted for 30-some seasons on MTV, and oh. then MTV gave, decided to give it a rest, give the brand a rest. A couple years ago, we had a lot of success on Facebook with a show called Ball and the Family. So we went back to MTV and we said, hey, Facebook, what would you think about bringing back MTV's The Real World on Facebook. And they said, great idea. Not only do we want it in English, but we want it in Spanish and in Thai. <laughs> so we're, no, we're now currently doing MTV's The Real World in three separate productions, three separate languages for Facebook Watch. So that's how distribution is changing. I mean, we really don't care where you watch it. We only care that you watch it. So that is one example of how distribution channels have changed sort of our approach to how we're actually even doing production. Well, it sounds like you're seeing the future more as a content opportunity than it is a technology opportunity. Absolutely. I mean, the, the technology is changing that, but what it's doing is it's dropping the barrier of entry for everybody, all players. Therefore, you're competing against a lot more content. 
So really, it comes down to a democracy of ideas. The best ideas prevail. The best ideas catch eyeballs, and therefore they, they win. Well, let me push back against you on yeah. that. I've heard sure. the phrase content is king many, many, many times. But yeah. it seems to me it's a combination of both content and marketing. You can have great content. If you can't tell the world, you're still stuck. That is true. But they do sort of go hand in hand. And that's why when you partner with a distribution platform, you have their built-in marketing machine. So, yeah, that helps get you eyeballs. But, again, it's you have a really great idea. It's not impossible to get attention and to go viral. We've all seen, you know, somebody starts a little thing in their garage and something goes viral and suddenly they make a major deal with Netflix for (laughs) a version of the show. Well, thinking of Netflix, there's a lot of discussion about non-network distribution, which is called OTT for over the top. This includes Netflix and Amazon. From your perspective, is there a difference in the shows that you're creating for traditional network use versus the shows you create for OTT services? Well, aside from being able to cuss, uh, (laughs) uh, you know, (laughs) network standards, and by network I mean typical classical broadcast standards, you know, are very restrictive both in language and content, um, nudity, sexual situations, things like that. You don't have some of those same restrictions in OTT. But let's face it, common sense prevails. If your goal is to get as many viewers as possible, you don't want to necessarily annoy people. So some of the same least common denominator rules still apply to these more specialized distribution platforms. Are you seeing a difference in technical specs, or are you still having to meet roughly the same standards in both cases? Yes and yes. Uh, the <laughs> difference is that there are more techs, you know, you know, you know the, the joke about technical specs. You never met a standard you don't like because there's so many of them. Yeah. Same thing applies here is everyone seems to have a slightly different requirement, but they are all in the ballpark of what we're used to for traditional broadcast. What are you seeing happening in terms of deadlines and budgets? <laughs> Deadlines getting shorter, <laughs> budgets shrinking. <laughs> that was an easy question. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a given. I think the way to address that is to stretch out the deadlines, and therefore you can do more with less. But when networks come to you at the last minute and say, can you get it done tomorrow, then you have to move heaven and earth, and that gets expensive. If they come to you and say, hey, we want something six months from now, then you have the opportunity to plan. But this business has never been known for uh, forward thinking. No, I was just wondering, when was the last time you had a client give you six months to plan? Hmm. They usually do, but then they debate about it until the <laughs> last week. <laughs> the last week. <laughs> so it's maybe, 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 hurry up, we need it yesterday. How many people work at Buna Murray these days? It depends on when you ask. If we're at full tilt in the summer at you know high tide, full production, including people on, on crews on production, you know, near a thousand. But that varies a lot during the year when a show is finished and, and we're just in post or so. So I'd say anywhere from 300 to a thousand, depending on when you ask. You focus more on post than production. What skills are you looking for for the people you want to hire? Intelligence, number one, curiosity, number two, and a healthy lack of ego. And by that, I mean, sometimes ego gets people in trouble because they think they're bigger than they are. Especially if you're starting out, your ego has to match your skill set. I noticed you didn't mention any particular software or hardware skills. Uh, (laughs) A couple things. Number one, we like to promote from within, certainly in an entry-level position. Uh, You know, we have our summer interns are, are coming in soon. You know, we don't have any expectations of them knowing any one platform or another. So we do use Adobe Premiere Pro. We do use Avid Media Composer. We do have Blackmagic Resolve. So those are three separate programs that have a a niche need within our organization. So it's kind of hard for me to say, hey, we only use one or the other because we use them all. You've mentioned that client expectations remain high. Deadlines get increasingly short. Budgets get smaller. Yep. What are you seeing as the future of post? It sounds like this is a, an area of diminishing returns. Well, we're always being asked to do more with less. By that, I mean less time, more media to wade through. And that's a challenge. I think the future, you're going to have 
some technology supporting that. I don't know necessarily how AI is going to work into that problem, but you're going to have technology supporting human effort. So it's going to be a combination of both of those things to sort of get us through the day. Some things are going to become easier, things like color correction or checking quality control, things like that. That's going to be more automated. But storytelling, that's a tough one. That's tough to automate, and that's tough to figure out considering how we do production. And for people that want to learn how you are meeting that compelling challenge today, where can they go on the web? It's www.bunammurray.com. That's B-U-N-I-M hyphen M-U-R-R-A-Y dot com. And the Senior Vice President of Post-Production is Mark Radonis. And Mark, thanks for joining us today. It is always fun talking with you. Always a pleasure, Larry. Thanks for calling. You know, I've been thinking a lot about technology recently. One of Mark Rodonis's comments struck a chord as he was describing dealing with ever larger shooting ratios and ever decreasing deadlines. The solution for Mark is automating clip review and perhaps automating color grading. These tools make sense when you're trying to find a one hour story out of 4,000 hours of footage, but the technology won't stop there. As Terry Curran said, the more technology improves, the more likely the middle class of post will get squeezed out. While I'm not as pessimistic about the future as Terry, I'm still concerned. This morning, a group of computer science faculty and I were interviewing a potential teaching candidate. After her presentation was over, we began discussing the impact of technology. The first rule of any business is to remain in business, specifically to continue to make money and, ideally, grow. This means that technology companies are always looking for new ways to develop technology. Back in the early days of personal computers, back when we compared mainframes to mini-computers to microcomputers, the goal of technology was to empower people. The impact of word processing and spreadsheets was truly revolutionary. Now, however, I think the focus has changed. To me, it seems the goal of technology today is about empowering computers. The cloud, artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data are all technologies used to make computers smarter. In the U.S., we tend to launch new technology, then figure out the societal impact later. For those whose neighborhoods are awash in electric scooters, you know what I mean. However, the situation is different in Europe. The European Commission recognizes AI as one of the 21st century's most strategic technologies and is increasing its annual investment in AI by 70% as part of the research and innovation program called Horizon 2020. A Horizon 2020 press release stated that the EU has a strong regulatory framework for technology ethics that will set the global standard for human-centric and trustworthy AI. To this end, the EU Commission has set up a high-level expert group and tasked it with drafting AI ethics guidelines as well as preparing a set of recommendations for broader AI policy. According to the guidelines, three components are necessary in order to achieve trustworthy AI. First, it should comply with the law. Second, it should fulfill ethical principles. And third, it should be safe and technically robust since, even with good intentions, AI systems can cause unintentional harm. We can't stop the rush of technology, but we can take the time to think about the results of what we're creating. Personally, I think the ethics of technology will become a major issue during the next decade. Just something I'm thinking about. I want to thank our guests this week, Jonathan Handel with The Hollywood Reporter, Terrence Curran with Alpha Dogs, Oliver Peters with Oliver Peters Post-Production Services, Christopher Ray with Picture Shop, Mark Radonis with Buna Murray, and James DeRuvo with Doddle News. 
There's a lot of history in our industry, and it's all posted to our website at digitalproductionbuzz.com. Here you'll find thousands of interviews, all online and all available to you today. And remember to sign up for our free weekly show newsletter that comes out every Saturday morning. Talk with us on Twitter at dpbuzz and Facebook at digitalproductionbuzz.com. Transcripts are provided by TakeOne.tv. Our theme music is composed by Nathan Doogie Turner with additional music provided by SmartSound.com. Our producer is Paulina Borowski. My name is Larry Jordan, and thanks for listening to the Digital Production Buzz. Digital Production Buzz is copyright 2019 by Thalo LLC.